Welcome to the Profitable Farmer Podcast, where it's all about increasing the profitability of your farm by working smarter, not harder. G'day everyone. Before we get into this next podcast, I owe you an apology. The audio at my end in this interview was substandard and I didn't realise until the end of the interview. But the conversation with Tony Ma was so compelling, we've decided to launch it anyway. So for this interview, please put up with substandard audio and we'll be sure to correct this for future episodes. Thank you and enjoy. G'day and welcome once again to Profitable Farmer. I hope you're all well um, as this season unfolds um, and enjoying what's coming. In this podcast, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Tony Ma, the CEO of National Farmers Federation to you. Um, Growing up on a farm in Southwest Victoria, now CEO to National Farmers Federation, following an impressive career in food manufacturing, agribusiness, economics, trade and policy. Um, I'm delighted to have Tony join us and to give us a bit of oversight as to his take on our current reality at the moment um, and the 2030 roadmap in particular that NFF has pioneered now three or four years ago um, and to give us an update on how um, things are progressing there. Tony, sincerely, thank you for your time. G'day, Jeremy. Uh, Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have a chat. So, Tony, we'll jump straight in. I'm, I'm intrigued. Um, with all that's going on in the world, um, economy, COVID, all of that, where does the CEO of NFF focus at the moment? <laughs> uh, in many places. It's, um, it's, a, it's a great job. It's a busy job and um, there's always something happening. So right at the moment, um, we are focused on the election, to be honest. We want to make sure that um, you know, the parliament, I think it's the 47th parliament, but the, the party that gets to govern in that parliament, um, we want to make sure that agriculture is in the forefront of their mind. And there's a lot happening in the world at the moment. So it's a really big challenge, a big task. Um, so that's our that's our agenda is to is to make sure that everyone knows and, and the big parties and the cross benches and, you know, um, everyone, we're, we're flat out just saying, You know, when and if you get into power, these are the things we want you to focus on and and give us your thoughts on um, how you think you're going to do that. So, um, and, you know, maintaining relationships with all parties, which we do. Um, So it it really does come to the fore in this six-week circus, you know, election campaign. Um, But there's lots of work um, beforehand in terms of maintaining relationships. So, Jeremy, that's what we're we're spending our our days at the moment, just, you know, um, talking to people and and making sure they know what our agenda um, and issues are. Tony, what's your read on the world that we're in at the moment? You know, we've got COVID impacting supply chains, um, a war in the Ukraine impacting a lot of our inputs and access. We've got interest rate changes and talk of potentially hyperinflation and a whole lot of other considerations. What's your take? Is this a unique um, reality that we find ourselves in? And what's your what's your read on it for the Australian farmer? Yeah, it is pretty unique, I think, Jeremy. Um, I mean, the first thing that I, I normally go to is what, what's happening in uh, you know in the paddock in in, in on farms. And uh, my read, uh, and I'm always you know cautious when I say this, but but let me say it: um, the production. Um, environment at the moment is is pretty good. There, I know there's still some dry areas that, that, that seem to not get the rain when it comes, but by and large, I would say um, the the production uh, capability and environment and system at the moment is really good for for agriculture, um, and and that's a good thing. So we'll, there'll always be volatility and fluctuations in markets and things at the moment. But if um, you know, worst case scenario, we're sort of in in droughts, you know, with the long drought um, that we last had um, is still in many people's minds. And I look back to where we were, you know, 2018, 2019, um, terrible, terrible droughts. Um, and and we've moved on from there. Um, 
and the, the, the industry is in a pretty good spot. So um, that's the first point for me that we're, we're going okay as an industry. The value, you know, we're, we're scheduled to, to get to $80 billion farm gate value. We started with our roadmap, which you alluded to at 58 or $60 billion. So in four or five years, the value of the industry has grown $20 billion. Um, again, that was off a, off a low point probably around the drought, but that's a pretty good indicator and that is unique. That's the highest value, I think, the industry's ever been at so um that's a that's a you know a guide post for me if people say how we're going um generally speaking not too bad um you're right it's a volatile time globally um and uh and you know with a whole range of things certainly the, the war in ukraine um as a, as a major ag producer um is is huge um the input costs i know that farmers are dealing with i, I talked to lots of farmers and the, the input costs is, is just really a concern and getting parts and machinery and tires and things like that so the day-to-day -day practicalities um impacted by things like you know ukraine and, and china and, and things like that so pretty unique time and then throw an election a federal election in on top of that so um yeah pretty unique uh, set of circumstances at the moment but um and then you know not even to mention COVID the last couple of years how uh, how the industry's dealt with COVID so um probably an understatement to say we're in a unique um unprecedented times and I know the word unprecedented has been used lots but um but it's certainly the case the the one thing I would say just to finish up Jeremy is that um despite all of that uh, I'm just so grateful to work in an industry um, that has been able to power on through all of those challenges, you know, floods and fires and droughts and, you know, extreme weather events, and the industry still keeps going. It's been one of the industries in the last couple of years that has powered on and, uh, and you know, thank goodness it has because, yes, we've had a few shortages on supermarket shelves, but by and large, farmers have been on the job, been able to do their job. Um, and keep the wheels of this country turning. So that's um, that gives me, you know, in my job, um, even though, you know, I'm not on a farm producing, um, it gives me great pride to work in, that in, in an industry like this. Yeah, well put. I mean, we've been fortunate um, in addition to what you've described, haven't we, compared to so many other sectors. Um, with with interest rates likely to increase and, and the economy perhaps to go into some sort of a recovery mode, um, what are your what's your take on how things might unfold from here? Uh, yeah, I think um, they're probably going to be a little bit more, you know, continue to be a bit more volatile. Interest rates, um, really, they can only go up. Um, and and I, I suspect that business people, farmers included, have been aware of that. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking that most people would be preparing for you know a rise in interest rates how quickly they will go up is going to be the the, the challenge um at record low so if they kick up a you know a percent or two that's going to have an impact on people's cash flow um and debt and and you know business decisions and things like that so that's going to happen um but i hope that the last couple of years if if you know it is that that people have had a couple of good years then they're in a position to actually um not only plan for that but manage that when it comes so i i, I hope that's the case um likewise with prices i mean prices again really cautious when i say this a bit but prices are pretty good at the moment um uh again probably record highs for things like canola and um and wheat and stuff like that you know sorghum um then they're, they're not bad so i hope that people are preparing for the downturns and whether that means interest rates or whether that means you know more uh, reduced prices or whether that means um not as conducive production situation so I, I suspect i hope it's a little way off but i suspect the next drought's on its way somewhere um so you know that sort of thing is always in my mind about being a resilient industry really making sure that we um, maximize the good times because we know agriculture is a really volatile industry and and it's likely that we're going to have a drought in the next you know five or so years um and i know how crippling they are so um that's kind of in the forefront of my mind you mentioned that jump to $80 billion of farm output. Um, in 2019, I think you led the creation of a new vision for NFF and a roadmap for 2030. 
Uh, that vision, I think, is $100 billion of farm output by 2030. Is that correct? Yep, that's right. That's a document. I've got various iterations. This is an old dog-eared one that I carry around with me. So, um, yeah, 2018, we we launched that that uh, aspirational vision to have the industry valued at $100 billion by 2030. And here we are at 2022 and it's uh, valued at, you know, $80 billion, a tick over $80 billion. So, um, uh, I'd love to say it was all our doing. It's clearly not. Um, you know, the, as I say, the, the environment um, conditions have been a major driver in that and markets and things like that. But what we wanted to do with that roadmap, um, and hopefully you can see it behind me, but um, it became a light on the hill for us. We said, let's set ourselves an aspirational target as an industry and then let's put in place a few stepping stones and a few ideas on how we think we can get there. Um, and and the, the really pleasing thing, and in some ways it's um, it's continues to surprise me and amaze me, but everyone's just jumped on it. You know, the governments, banks, in unis, oppositions, everyone has said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Let's let's do it. Let's and it's now the new narrative, you know. Um and uh and that's just so um so exciting that people have have uh, jumped onto that and supported it and got behind it and embraced it. And so, um, you know, now we've got government departments saying, well, we've got to get this $100 billion. How are we going to do it? And and they're just coming around to this this discussion. Um, we've got states saying, well, we want to be 20, 20 billion by 2030. You know, we've got New South Wales and, and other states saying, well, what's our contribution to the $100 billion? So it's been um, just... Uh, so exciting to see people get behind that vision. So I've still got to deliver on it. And when we launched it, um, I said that. I said no point having a vision and having this nice document to sit on the shelf. So um, we're still going to deliver. We're still going to report on how we're going. And every year we have reported against how we're going, the plan. And, and the, the farm gate value is one indicator. So it's the, it's the predominant one. But there's a whole range of other things in there that we can sort of tick off and go, okay, look, we've done that or we fell short on that. So we issue a report card every year on how we're going against it. We teach strategic planning to farming families. We talk about the importance of having a vision that everyone's enrolled and inspired by. It's not yeah. surprising that that in the setting down of that, that people have come on board and got on board with it. Well done. Um, Luck and good management, Jer Jeremy, I tell you. They, they just, we got it at the right time and um, I'll, I'll take a little bit of credit, but it's uh, but it's the industry that's jumped around and, and we're, yeah, we're just so pleased and and happy that um, it's it's resonated. You know, some of these things, you, you throw these things out and some of them fall flat. This one, for whatever reason, hasn't. So, we're, you know, we're very grateful. Just out of interest, what was the process you went through to create yeah. that and to create the roadmap? We'll get into the details of the roadmap shortly, but what was the process just for everyone's benefit? Yeah, um, so it was, a, it was, I've said this a couple of times, it was a, um, it was a fantastic process. We went to, I think it was 26 places around the country. Um, and when I committed to it, I said, oh, yeah, that sounds fine. By about the 20th um, workshop that we did in, um, you know, Long Reach Bowling Club, um, I was I was just, just about over it, but we did 26. So we went from literally Long Reach to Launceston, from Katanning to... Um, to Wagga, you know, we went up and down and across the country and we, we sat in bowling clubs and shearing sheds and talked to farmers and, and producers and um, not just uh, farmers, but banks and unis and government departments and, and got everyone's thoughts on, on, you know, what do we want the vision to be and what's the challenges, what's the opportunity. So it was a bit of a... Um, uh, a process and and our partner um, Telstra helped us do that. So we you know we we placed a lot of importance on our partners and and they um, went with us and, and went on the journey. So we we bashed all that into a document, um, which is you know that that document which uh, is kind of uh, the Bible that we you know that we carry around with us. Um, that's that's how it came out. It, it took a lot of work and but it was it was really it was great fun and, and experience to go around and um, and have these chats with people in their backyards. That was really important to us. It wasn't the worst thing we could have done is, you know, me sitting in an office in Canberra saying, oh, this is what I think the industry needs to look like. So we were never going to do that. Um, we had we have 
had to and made sure we did go out and listen to people, got their input. And I hope in a small way that has contributed to people embracing it is that, okay, they can kind of see where we got to and how we got there and stuff. So, um, yeah, that was it in 2018. We did that for, um, wasn't a full six months, but over a six month period, we, I went to 26 workshops around the country. What have been some of the key achievements so far, Tony? Um, there's been a few. Uh, the One of them just is in the front of my mind at the moment is the ag visa. We've, we've had that for a little while. It, the, you know, the workplace issues in the agriculture sector have been something um, that have been a real, has been a real challenge. So uh, that's, uh, you know, something that has, was right at the beginning of, of the roadmap. Um, some of the trade stuff that we've we talked about in the um, in the roadmap has you know obviously helped. We've had a few disruptions in the trade space, of course, but um, uh, trade market access was always going to be one of the one of the big ones. Um, um, we've had things like Jeremy um, more focus on sustainability management. So, you know, ecosystem services or natural capital or, you know, biodiversity, whatever you want to call it, recognising the role that farmers play in managing the landscape and the work that they do every day to make sure that the land, the water, the environment is maintained, improved, managed um, and getting recognised for that rewarded for that and markets to be developed so they can actually, farmers can actually make a dollar out of it. The, the needle's really shifted in that space and it's been driven a little bit by the whole carbon discussion, but it's broader than carbon. It's about, you know, managing um, soil and, and biodiversity and, you know, the, the natural capital which farmers deal with every day to do their job. So that's been a real um, shift. There's, got, there's more work to be done in that space, but that, that's a real um, – that's been a real shift. Uh, it's got people on the roof. I hope you can't hear it walking around. Um, yeah, look, at EU trade agreement, um, on-farm safety, things like that, you know, diversity in, in agriculture. We've got, we've got a program that we've been running for five years or so now about – um, identifying opportunities for um, rural women or, or women to have take leadership positions in agriculture. So there's been, you know, um, th that's a great program that we started, you know, from scratch uh, there and it's now built into a, a really successful and really supported program. So there's been things like, you know, those that just off the top of my head that, um, that we've been able to progress. It's such a diverse document. I think there's six key pillars that underpin the document, Tony. Um, do you mind this five? Sorry, oh, mind, five. And there, there's five and those mega trends that I was. Thinking. Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, you're right. Um, yeah. So uh, we we went and and the way that we did it is, um, you know, we we probably could have had the pillars. And, we probably could have had 10. We we probably could have named them all differently. But the, where we ended up was um, customers, you know, cut we're, we're an industry that requires um, customers to like our product and it's not necessarily um, different to any other business. But um, for agriculture, it's food and fibre. So you're not buying a fridge or you're not buying a flat screen TV or whatever. Um, you're buying something that you actually consume. So it's incredibly essential important that we have customers on board you know we're not the minerals industry um people dig stuff out of the ground it gets transformed three or four times into a different product they, you know carrots come out of the ground they get washed they go into your mouth it's it's we're, we're a very tangible industry so customers um are absolutely important that's the first pillar <clears throat> um the sustainability is the second pillar and that's um as i say it's Land management, you know, nat managing the natural capital that farmers deal with is um, is incredibly important as well. Without it, we can't do our job, or farmers can't do their job. Um, the third pillar is innovation, so technology and and making sure that we continue to adapt and look for improvements in the business. And again, it's a kind of 
business fundamental. But for agriculture, I feel like Australian farmers are incredibly innovative, always looking for ways they can do stuff a little bit better. And early up um, adopters of technology, depending on what sector you're in. Um, so there's been, you know, the, the developments in technology and equipment and machinery in agriculture um, blow me away. Like I, I've been lucky enough to sit in a few um, machines and I feel like I'm, you know, flying the space shuttle on some of these machines. They're just the, the tech that is in them is just incredible. And I don't think the community knows how high tech agriculture is. Um, some of us that, that work in the industry get to know how how much innovation there's been um, in, in the, the equipment. It just always blows me away when I see it. Um, people is the fourth and communities is the fourth pillar. Um, the labour issue um, is, has always been a bit of a challenge, getting people in the industry, making sure they've got a career path. Um, and the fifth pillar is... Uh, capital and risk management. I think we talked about the the volatility of the industry, and um, you know managing risk, whether it's droughts, floods, fires, extreme weather events, um, and getting enough capital into the industry. So that's the fifth pillar um, that we've that we've built the, the roadmap around. Jeremy, thanks, Tony. I'm going to jump around a bit, but just just while we're touching on this, the the dedicated agri visa that you mentioned before, and you mentioned that you've made real progress there, and you also mentioned a, a labour a whole lot of labour shortages and that labour issue. Um, can you tell us a bit about what that dedicated agri visa is intended to achieve, and what impact you think it can have? Yeah, so the. There's a range of so let me start at the beginning. We, we've we've had real trouble as an industry attracting domestic workers to come and do jobs on farms. So whether that's you know seasonal work like picking oranges, or whether that's you know um, uh, part time work like working in a dairy or a piggery or something, you know a few hours a day or something. Um, we've always we've struggled to for people to see agriculture as a career. So we, we haven't been able to attract the domestic workers. So that has meant that we've had a reliance on foreign workers. Now they could be backpackers. Um, from Europe um, or Canada or, or and, and there's been a long history of people coming over to do that. So whether they're driving headers, they're experienced machinery operators from Canada or, or Europe or wherever, or whether they're, um, you know, people out of uni that have come here and pick a fruit as they go uh, between bars and between surf breaks, you know, that they, they come and do a bit of work to get a bit of money and get their second year visa. So these arrangements that are in place at the moment, um, and, and or with the other one is um, you know Pacific Island uh, workers that are coming in here. So those visas, the backpacker visa or the seasonal worker visa, um, were, were designed around cultural exchange or economic assistance. Um, so the, the cultural exchange is the backpackers, and the seasonal workers is the economic um, assistance. So they're they're in a, in a way they're they're foreign aid. You know these people come in, they work for six months, they go home um, with money and spend it in their community, and it's an economic development. They weren't designed to address a labour shortage. They were designed for something else. So we have said we need some a visa that actually is designed to address a labour shortage, not to give people an experience in the country, which albeit fantastic as it is, not to you know give people six months work here and take home and spend in their community as it's fantastic as that is. It's actually specifically designed around the workforce needs in agriculture. And that's what we've spent years doing. Um, and we've got it just about over the line with the current government. They committed to it and they got one country signed up to do it. We want 10 countries signed up to actually, so when I say signed up, commit to providing work a workforce to come in on this visa. So it's a subclass of visa that allows them to come in, go from farm to farm, depending on what their situation is, um, you know, reduce costs for them, um, make sure they're looked after when they're on farm because the last thing we want is people exploited or mistreated on farms. So it's it's specifically designed. It's not a holiday visa. It's not, not an economic A visa. It's an ag visa, working visa. You think it'll um, address, in addition to that labour shortage in the paddock, if you like, um, the farm manager, more senior skill set and bringing in, I guess, more experienced human capital into the industry? It, it could. It's not It's not going to be a panacea for everyone. Um, it'll, it'll allow people to come in. And what we hope is that when they come in um, and, you know, if they stay, um, 
there'll be opportunity for them to become farm managers to cut, you know, to to climb that ladder. Um, but we we've also identified and acknowledged that this isn't going to be, um, you know, the, the the silver bullet that saves the the labour issue. We've got to do more work around you know, either tertiary qualified or vocationally qualified um, people to come into the industry. So it, it's a massive issue. So we can't just focus on foreign foreign workers. We've got to do more in the education communication space to make sure people know there are careers in agriculture. And you don't have to, if you don't want to, work all day in a dairy or sit in a tractor cab. You know, there's, there's jobs that you can do in agriculture that um, allow you to do that but there's a career path. So we haven't, that's kind of another stream of this whole discussion, but the, the ag visa is getting people into the country, do those jobs that need to be doing, whether it's on a dairy or picking mangoes or, or you know, working in a, um, in a meat processing plant or something like that. We just haven't got the people that want to do those jobs. I think in the roadmap that one of your targets is a 25% increase in the ag workforce and also a double of the tertiary and vocational graduates coming out of unis and related entities. Um, how do we achieve that? Lots of hard work and over a long period of time. Um, so the, the foreign workers will help get that 25% increase. Um, and we you know set that target as we, we debated about it carefully. Um, it's, a, it's an aspirational target to get more people in here. Uh, so that's one way. We, we just have to get more foreign workers into this country. And the last couple of years, of course, have prevented that or made that really difficult. They're starting to come back now. Um, but the domestic approach around, you know, getting more people into universities to do agriculture is an ongoing challenge, I have to say. The, um, I'm trying to think what uni it was I was talking about the other day. Uh, and they were, I oh know it was actually vets. It was it was a different different discussion. Um, there, there's people in universities that are doing agriculture, um, probably not enough of them, and and they don't stay in the industry long enough either. So um, we've got to map out career paths. We've got to actually demonstrate that you know you can start doing um, what might be you know a, a basic job, but there is so many career paths in agriculture. If you're doing law, for example, at university, you can do law in agriculture. You know, and and, and here's a little anecdote that some people might have heard before. But I mean, um, my son's just finished year twelve, and I got an email the other day from his school, and from in fact my old school as well, saying we're having a career night. Um, you know, if you're in manufacturing, if you're in engineering, if you're in teaching, if you're in nursing, if you're in education, do you want to come and sit on a stall and tell the kids about an industry? Agriculture wasn't on the list. Like, the kid, you know, schools don't think that we should promote agriculture as an industry. So last year, um, I actually went and bought some cotton, some sunflowers and some fruit and set up a stall and said agriculture and, and went and sat at my son's school and said, I want people to think about agriculture as a career. No one had ever heard of agriculture as a career. They just don't think of it. So that's those basic, and that's a real story. Um, you know, people people don't see agriculture as a career. Schools don't see it. They send out emails saying to old boys saying, come and tell the kids coming through about a career. But agriculture is not on the list. And that's a real shame. This thing there, do you think? Awareness. If, 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 other, if other industries can nail that, you know, accounting, legal, yep. physiotherapy, is it that we're a really fragmented and diverse industry so there's not that um, career map for that graduate? Or what, what, what do you think is missing? I think that's probably it. But, um, you know, and I would say this, of course, being CEO of the NFF, but that's a real strength. I mean, the diversity in the industry should mm. be a real strength that mm. you don't have to just look at people's knees all day if you're a physiotherapist you know i mean you can go and work in agriculture and every day can be different you can move from one sector to another but anyway um but we, we just haven't got a good um simple you know message around jobs in agriculture that it's a real career path um and we're starting to so we've got for example we've this year we've started an ag career start 
a um, program which, you know, we got some money from the government to actually promote it. And it's a gap year, basically, for people to come spend a year on a farm and they get grouped with a cohort of, you know, in, in the first year, 50 people, that young people that get placed on farms. They get, you know, um, some education, some training. The farmer gets, you know, some education and training. And the idea is to give them a great experience um, that they might not have thought about. So we thought, well, you know, they're not able to travel or they don't really want to travel overseas. Let's get them to travel in Australia, give them a gap year in agriculture. So the Air Force and, you know, services have gap years for, for their thing. So it's, it's one idea that we've kicked off with the government, thanks to some government funding, and said, well, why don't we have an ag gap year? show people what's in agriculture and if they they, they get paid um you know obviously um but things like that just got to do more things like that there there are great jobs but we don't we're not in the the, the the highway of telling people about it that's all about the diversity of our industry how good do you think we are as employers uh good question um there's unfortunately there's too many cases of um, of people being exploited, and they they um, they attract the the media. Um, it's it's unfortunate that you know we, we're perhaps not seen as um, as a employer of choice, and that is that is one of the goals in the roadmap that we are um, a trusted industry, and that we are seen as an employer of choice. Um, so we've got to work. We've got to you know address and acknowledge that there are some weaknesses in our industry. Um, fact of the matter is it's, you know, it can be hot, hard, cold, difficult work in agriculture. You're not, you're not sitting at a desk sometimes. You're, you're dealing with animals, you're dealing with the weather, you're dealing with, um, you know, the environment. So it's not going to be for everyone. We, are, we have to acknowledge that. And, and some of the work's hard, you know. Some of the work is, it's, it's hard yakka. That suits some people, won't suit some others. Yeah, I wonder too on this issue that we're talking about whether the other sectors that seem to be doing this well have a minimum standard for the physiotherapist or the accountant um, that they need to be certified to or um, um, comply with so that they are professional in their conduct and in their duty as an employer. I wonder if there's more that can be done there to to give farmers a stamp of approval as a as a professional employer definitely yep that's a really good point and i agree with it 100 we, we don't have you know a trade um necessarily we've got cert threes and things like that in agriculture you know we've got various tickets and and certifications that you can get but we you don't go to uni for four years and come out as a physiotherapist or six years as a vet. You, you, you've got to sort of add to it. So mm. that is something that we're also working on, the vocational um, education standards and, and system that we'd love to sort of have to build on it. I know there are you know certificates out there that you can do um, and diplomas and things, but we, we've got to work at that. And that goes to that diversity that you're talking about in the, in the industry. A link to that, to achieve the vision for 2030 of $100 billion of output, ultimately it requires our farmers to be more efficient and more profitable and more productive. Yep. Um, how, do we, how do we do that? Um, I think we, we continue to try and incentivise them but also uh, leverage the work that um, is being done in RDCs, you know, in the research and development corporations and also in... Um, some of these innovation hubs that have been that have sprung up recently um, with the government funding them. Um, so there's there's lots of research, lots of innovation that's being done. The challenge is to get it adopted and get it taken up through the industry. So I think that's kind of one of the key um, parts, but also making sure that people have got the ability and the capacity to to break new ground in terms of, you know, new business um, ideas, new products, um, new ways of presenting old products. And I feel like that ha is happening um, anyway. Every time I go into the supermarket, I sort of feel like there's another different variation on, you know, um, a leg of lamb that, you know, 30 years ago you would have seen just a bunch of leg of lambs. Now with the amount of different cuts of meat and the way that they're presented and, 
it gives me great confidence that the industry will continue to evolve and, and adapt to consumer preferences and things. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm really confident we'll continue to do that. But the, the practical innovation and, and day-to-day um, activities that farmers take and do, um, they'll continue to evolve, we've got no doubt about that, with technology and, and with, you know, um, hopefully new, new people coming into the industry too mentioned that spaceship that you sat in recently. What are some of the innovations impacting farmers that you're most excited about, Tony? Yeah, the technology always excites me. That header that I sat in, I was just blown away. It was um, you know, a million-dollar machine and uh, I managed not to crash it. But um, but uh, the, the technology, the sensors, you know, the, the, um, the digital, there's a lot of, um, in some ways, there's a lot of hype about digital agriculture, but there, there is right in the middle of it, there's some real um, tangible um, tools and, and um, ideas that can make uh, real differences. Um, I've, uh, again, I went to a, a property in, in the territory where, you know, they have, they've got this facility that uh, it's like a, a, it's not like a feedlot, but it's a, a weighing station that, you know, the, the cattle go through to get to the water and it takes a, um, a, their details of how much weight they've put on and how far, you know, they've walked and these sorts of things. So that technology for, you know, remote cattle station um, is just amazing. So, um, uh, and some of the feedlot technology that I've seen as well is, is so that stuff always excites me. Um, and And some of the things that farmers are doing, Around carbon and and um, and natural capital, you know, measuring measuring their environmental um, impact and what they're doing to improve and manage the environment. That always gives me great confidence, and um, because there's there's more pressure being placed on the industry in terms of that space. So I'm really confident we can um, uh, continue to improve in that space too. What is your take on the carbon market and? policies and reform in that area and what are your predictions for it over the next five or ten years i feel like it's going to um firm up a little bit i feel like the last decade or so um there's been lots of talk around um you know emissions and carbon and um commitments and things like that um so i feel like the industry is well placed i feel like there's various commitments and research that's been done across a whole range of sectors that um, there are challenges there and I, and I always am really clear there are challenges in, in the carbon space for agriculture um, and for climate change in agriculture. I mean, um, if, if it is that more extreme weather events are going to be um, more, more common, um, you know, the, the industry's almost by definition exposed to the elements. So we're going to have to get better at managing that um, and doing our bit. Um, But also there's opportunities. There are, I think, opportunities for farmers to uh, embrace uh, carbon, biodiversity, natural capital, and make sure that they, um, their business is is well prepared and and rewarded and recognised, but the industry as well uh, and the communities that they live in. So, yeah, you, know, you you have to look at so as an example the thing, and I know they're always not not as popular everywhere we go with everyone, but things like wind turbines, I mean, um, and solar farms, they're springing up now because people have seen an opportunity. Um, they do have their challenges. I, I accept that, um, and not everyone is going to be a fan of them. But in terms of resilience and managing the environment, that income stream that some farmers get from some of those technologies and, and it is new technology you know wind farm solar farm it's new new technology it wasn't around 50 years ago it is now um and, and I'm, I'm i'm confident and uh, that people can embrace it given the choice do you see farmers across the country rewarded for what they're doing sustainably and do you think the carbon market is that uh, not a, so the short answer is not enough yet um, there's not enough confidence, I don't think, in the methodologies and in the market, in the carbon market. Um, and I'm always really conscious of it being overhyped, the, the, the carbon, what farmers can get out of the carbon market. It'll work well for some people. It won't be suitable for, for others. Um, and um, not to say that there's trade-offs, but, but 
people have to make sure that it fits with their business. Um, and there, there's there's some risks with you know tying yourself up in that market and and not knowing. It's like any market; you just you got to know what you're you're getting in yourself in for. There, there's. I would say my my personal perspective is there. There's some real opportunities there, but people shouldn't think there aren't challenges either. Um, and it really depends on your own business. You you know, Jeremy, it comes down to people's risk appetite at the end of the day. You know, and and. I, I know a lot of farmers and a lot of them got very different risk uh, profiles and risk appetites. Completely agree. Um, linked to this, a question for you around trade policy and tariffs. We're one of the least supported ag industries in the OECD. Is there anything playing out for you um, and within this roadmap that sees that changing between now and 2030? I don't think I don't think uh, we're going to. I don't think the government, whatever persuasion, is going to um, go back down the regulated path of um, subsidies and, and assistance. Um, so, uh, depending on what how, how people perceive, you know, drought payments or flood payments and, and things like that, um, that's the one area where you know globally. People like to point and say, "Well, you're getting all these subsidies and things." Well, they're not. Um, they're not like subsidies in other countries where they get, you know, 40, 50, 80 percent of their income from government payments. Uh, you know, that that's just not a thing here, and, and I don't think it's going to be a thing. Um, and I would say, as, as harsh as it might sound, um, the the nature of our industry is that um, we're pretty lean and mean. You know, we, we've we've been um, have to produce in a way that is globally competitive without subsidies, um, some would say that's a good thing. Yep. So, there, might some, there might be some that don't agree with that, but, um, you know. We, 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 like, when you're competing with um, your countries where the subsidies are significant, you know, as you say, being paid 40 or 50% for setting, setting land aside or whatever, it, it does have to make us more resilient and more efficient and um, more capable, you would think. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, there, there might be some that uh, don't necessarily agree with that. <laughs> anyway. One of the other things I noticed in the capital and risk management pillar that we touched on, um, you've stated a massive capital shortfall of $159 billion to fund the growth that is predicted to 2030. Um, can you speak to that? What do you mean by that capital shortfall? Yeah, so um, it's the, the hypothesis is that, you know, we need to invest in, in whether it's technology or infrastructure that allows us to, to remain competitive. So um, that can be on-farm infrastructure. So it can be, you know, tanks or, or dams or, um, um, you know, energy, investing in energy um, efficiencies on farms. So moving away from, you know, what might be a, a diesel generator or, or um, so that sort of, um, business to business investment, but the infrastructure that allows farmers to get their product to market or, or to um, to the supplier or processor, you know, um, investment in roads. I was down in Yarrawonga the other day, and we we're talking about roads and and the um, the roads that some of these you know high tech machinery, so you know new B doubles uh, have to drive on, and it's it's no point having this amazing machinery that goes down the road and has to navigate, you know, what almost looks like a, a, a literal minefield of, of, a, of a road, you know. Like we've got to invest in the supply chain that allows us to get stuff to market in an efficient way. Um, and we've also got to look at um, what we do here in the last couple of years has become apparent, the, the security of, of the supply chain. Um, We've built up a supply chain that's just in time, and that's quite efficient. But things like fertilizer, fuel, uh, chemicals, um, we are really susceptible here nationally to imports. Now, if for whatever reason there's a disruption like there has been in the last couple of years, 
um, we don't have the capacity here to keep doing our job. So, you know, there's two or three examples of what investment in the industry I think could could help, could benefit. So, you know, domestic manufacturing, not to say that we have to do it all here, but I feel like, uh, you know, the, the scare around AdBlue, uh, the diesel supplement that, you know, was in December, January, um, I did. I did genuinely come out of a meeting with the government, and and I was shocked at how much of an impact um, that would have if, if we ran out of a, a bad blue um, right before Christmas. You know, and I was like, well, you know, think people think COVID's bad. Wait till the, the trucks stop going up and down the country because uh, they haven't got this bloody ad blue. So. Um, that's what that's the investment I think we're talking about. That's just a, a brief snapshot, but we 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 don't invest. I don't think as much in agriculture as we need, and, and some of those figures, um, yeah, I think that we needed to include those in the roadmap. So it's it's on the agenda. So we talk about investment. Hope that made some sense, Jeremy. Yeah, no, absolutely, it does. Where does that investment come from, and and linked to that, do you see land ownership changing? into this next decade? Uh, I think it will continue to change. I think that there's, over the last few decades, there's been consolidation in the industry. Um, uh, and I think there's been various uh, phases, I would say, of, of foreign investment, uh, you know, beginning way back in the, in the 70s or 80s. Um, and, and it tends to you know, go in, go in phases from various countries and things. Um, uh, so in terms of, of ownership, is it going to change? I think it'll continue to, inv- to evolve. Um, I really do hope there's new people coming into the industry. Um, but, again, talking to farmers, I know they, uh, well, some at least, Look over at the next door's paddock and and have in their mind one day they'll they'll grab that you know or, or their son or daughter will grab that and so there's always that consolidation aspect um, that's there as well so it's it's a pretty dynamic industry um, and I think it'll continue to evolve. Thanks, Tony. So um just one last area of exploration, if we could. How um. We talk about farmers, perhaps there's an opportunity that we're more professional as employers. We need to understand risk sort of better. Um, And there's a whole lot of sustainability and carbon and other considerations now at play. How enterprising and how entrepreneurial and how skilled do you think the Australian farmer is as a business person um, in navigating sort of the current climate and what's coming? What would be your comment? Uh, Two things jump to mind. And um, so the first one is that I would say that they're they're very innovative. They're they're always looking out, generally speaking, they're always looking out for um, for ways that they can not, well, not cut costs, but make their business more efficient. So if it means more investment and, you know, the the delivery is more efficiency, I think people are are up for that. You know, new technology, New products, always looking for, you know, another um, wheat variety or they'll try out a different canola variety or something like that for their particular conditions. Um, So I I genuinely think that farmers are um, adaptive and innovative and and just always looking for a a way to do business better. Um, I think uh, the... The one area that I think we have to keep working on as an industry is is the resilience factor. And I know it's not a popular word, but in terms of drought um, and decision making and using information to to help make decisions, I feel like that's an area that we've got to keep working on. So um, when when we say innovative um, and resilient and and um, uh, ingenuity, I think maybe you you used. Um, th- there's a, I feel like there's, that's a, a work in progress. We've still got to do more in that space because I, I still, um, you know, again, I'm not a farm owner, but I've seen um, various droughts impact farm businesses, and each time I still, I'm still troubled by the way that people are affected by drought, um, and droughts have been happening 
for a long time. And I think we've got to keep trying to get better at managing drought. And that's, that would be a work in progress for me. Thanks, Tony. Um, I really appreciate your time. It's been a broad conversation um, spanning each of those key five pillars of the roadmap. And it's been wonderful to get your take on our current reality and on, um, I guess, some of your predictions on on what's going to impact our industry and, and what's going to see us achieve that vision that you have set down um, at NFF for 2030. So um, really appreciate my time with you today. Really appreciate your comments. Um, and thank you. No, oh, thank you. It's been a, a pleasure. I could talk for another hour. I'd have to get a cup of tea because my voice is going a bit. But uh, I loved. Uh, I love talking about. I, I love. Uh, I love the industry. So I'm incredibly passionate about it. So uh, someone giving me 45 minutes to talk about it, um, I, I enjoy. So thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Tony. So really interesting to speak to Tony just now. Um, as I mentioned, a diverse conversation. Um, starting with just how lucky we are to be in the industry that we're in at this time. Um, and then to touch on those five pillars that underpin the 2030 roadmap that NFF have for our industry. Um, interesting to hear the degree that that's um, played in aligning governments, state and federal, and all the key major corporate players. Um, again, it speaks to how important it is for leaders to have a vision and by having a vision that that can enrol and inspire multiple people to come on board and help you make it happen. Um, really interesting to talk about how that roadmap intends to support more efficient um, connection between the farmer and the customer and, and logistics and innovation in the supply chain, um, how it speaks to the carbon market, um, and farmers being recognised more strongly for the part they play in sustainability and management of the environment, um, how it speaks to supporting advancement, innovation and uptake around ag tech and technology driving productivity and efficiency on farm. Um, I really enjoyed that conversation around bringing more um, workers into Australia through the dedicated agri visa and the support that NFF are throwing at unis and vocational courses to drive the level of um, graduation um, and people returning from those courses back into agriculture. Really interesting conversation there. And then we touched on the capital and risk piece um, briefly. Um, that shortfall in capital needed to fund the innovation and investment that's going to see us achieve that vision. Um, he finished by focusing in on the fact that we are, as farmers, enterprising and entrepreneurial. But even with that, what I gleaned from the conversation is that there is an opportunity for farmers to be more professional in how we employ people, to be more um, skilled in how we make decisions um, and manage risk like drought. Um, and all of that comes down to upskilling ourselves as business owners. And it brings me back to Farm Owners Academy. I can't help but think, and I love the comment, that a business will never outgrow its owner. And if you think about that for a minute, if I haven't invested in my own development for the last 10 years, um, I could be the thing holding my business back. And I actually deeply believe that there's a need for each of us as farmers. We're not running small businesses anymore. Most farms in Australia are turning over more than a million dollars, which means we're running serious businesses with a serious balance sheet. And we need to be investing actively in our own development so that we analyse well, we consider well, we look at alternatives thoroughly, we can analyse um, each of these investments that we might be making, be it around people, systems, ag tech, whatever, 
and make sure that we're making really strong decisions as business owners that are going to move our business forward and see us nail it in the next 5, 10, 20 years so that we're active participants and actively contributing perhaps in our own little way to that 2030 vision that Tony spoke to. So thank you for listening. I hope you found that as interesting as I did. Um, wonderful to speak to a leader who was candid, um, grounded, and um, pretty authentic and pretty real in his responses to my question. So thank you, Tony, again for your time. Um, there's a link to that 2030 roadmap um, in the intro to this podcast. I highly recommend that you download it and have a read. There's some really interesting insights that, in, that sort of overview our industry and they also speak to the mega trends around the industry that we're in. So there's lots of good information in there. Enjoy that. Tony, thanks again. And to all of you, look forward to catching up again in a couple of weeks. Bye for now.